research, and study the keyword to ensure our safety and protection, to bring food to the hungry. Thank you for the gift of consolation and hope. Pag sinabing Good Shepherd, ang una talaga nilang naisip, ube jam. <laughs>Good evening, Philippines and the rest of the world. Today is July 3, 2020, Feast of St. Thomas the Apostle. Thank God it's Friday. Let us welcome the weekends together with the religious men and women in the Philippines. I am Father Angel Cortez of the Order of Friars Minor. Join us tonight and be updated with the latest in consecrated life, the church and society. I am Sister Happy Montesilio of the Daughters of St. Anne. We will be your companions in your new religious routine every Friday evening. We are the 8 p.m. Habits. Welcome to our premiere episode and a warm welcome to, to our first guest co-host, Brother Daryl Husay of the Order of Hospitaller Brothers of St. John of God. Good evening, brother, and welcome to the 8 p.m. Habits. Good evening, Sister Happy and welcome, Father Angel. brother. <laughs> thank you for having me here. And thank you for answering to our invitation. It's, we are blessed to have you here with us in the 8 p.m. Habits. Thank it's you, an sir. honor and blessing, brother. To have thank you, for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, brother, it's, uh, yeah, you, or you have it. <laughs> You represent the AMRSP um, Joint Executive Board. Somehow okay, we can thank say, you. We can say <laughs> Good evening to our televiewers. Your APM Habits is more than just a news program. In fact, we have lots in store for you tonight, right? Right, Sister Happy, so keep the ball rolling. Let us begin with a pun game entitled Four Picks, One Word. The game is familiar to many and the mechanics are simple. The overall ob objective of the game is to guess the mystery word. To help you solve the mystery, we'll be showing four pictures as clues. The clues will be shown one by one throughout the entire show. 
as each picture is flashed, one of the letters of the word will also reveal. That's why you need to stay tuned to see all the clues. Here is the verse picture. Place your answers on the AMRSP Facebook page live comment section using this format. Hashtag 8pm habits. Hashtag 4 picks one word. Then your answers. But don't forget to share it first. No share icon is invalid. The first viewer to correctly guess the mystery word will be the winner of a special prize from AMRSP and the 8pm habits. Our staff will contact you on how you will claim your prize. The, the winner will be announced through a separate post in the AMRSP Facebook page as well as our next episode. So make sure to like and follow our AMRSP Facebook page for updates. Leading our stories tonight on the religious reports, religious and NGO groups decry senior government officials red-tagging of Benedictine sister Mary Jan Manansan. In a social media post last June 16, the 82-year-old nun slammed a Manila court's decision convicting Rappler Executive Director Maria Ressa, saying, quote, I strongly condemn the conviction of Maria Ressa and Rinaldo Santos Jr., by Judge Renelda Estacia Montesa. I am ashamed that she studied in Saints Co. I am sad that she did not learn the values of a scholastic and education. Whatever successes you may have attained, I am afraid you are a failure as a scholastican. Some consolation is that Maria Ressa is also a scholastican. Later, Presidential Communications Operation Office Undersecretary Lorraine Badoy accused Sister Mary John of being a member of the Communist Party of the Philippines, New People's Army, National Democratic Front, which she classified as a terrorist group. Here's some portion of our conversation with Sister Mary John. I don't think so, but anyway, you, you, can, you can cite that to justify your judgment. So uh, I know that she can justify it technicality. Pero, I was just thinking, I'm thinking kasi as a scholastic, eh. if, if our students have really, uh, what do you call that, internalized our values, our values kasi are truth, justice, and social transformation, then she, I would think that somebody who studied with us would, would look at this from the bigger perspective, that this is really a part of a whole, uh, of a whole uh, intention to uh, to crack down on dissenters, uh, especially because media journalism is a very powerful tool. And it, uh, oh, it is all clarified in all the statements of the organization. I couldn't clarify it more clearly. <laughs> I did it, and in fact, my goodness, sabi ko para bato obituary na yata ito, because they they expressed exactly. Uh, how to how to uh, they call that demolish what Badu said in the most excellent way. So I said, why should I add pa, uh, to it? Ano? Galing, galing na yung nilagay nila at saka atis, hindi galing sa akin. So I started to to pray for all of them. Kasi sabi ko, eh, Kristiyano ako. Eh, eh, this is just this week, ang dami-daming paalaala sa akin na pray for them to persecute. Do you love only your friends or do you love your enemies? Sabi ko, Ito na talaga. Ito na yung, yung hinihingin imposible ni, ni Jesus. And if I'm really a follower of Christ, alam nga man na I will not heed. Sister Mary John was former co-chairperson of the Association of Major Religious Superiors of the Philippines. The AMRSP recently came out with a statement on the matter. Catholic leaders unite in opposing House Bill 6875 or the anti-terror bill recently passed by Congress. In various statements, leaders from both the church hierarchy and religious congregations expressed their opposition to the bill, citing, among others, the broad definition of terrorism employed in the bill and the 24-day detention period for suspected terrorists. 
the bill seeks to amend the Human Security Act of 27. Sorry, ha? Of 2007 pala yan? Ulit na lang ang buong. Kaya simula doon sa after ng headline. Human Security Act of 2007. Ito, ito, in various statements, leaders from both the church hierarchy and religious congregations expressed their position to the bill, citing among others the broad definition of terrorism employed in the bill and the 24-day detention period for suspected terrorists. The bill seeks to amend the Human Security Act of 2007. Religious leaders are concerned about the new anti-terror bill will be used to silence political opposition and further shrink the, the democratic space in the country. In a statement, the AMRSP says that While we agree acts of violence have indeed ravaged our beloved land, causing the deplorable loss of lives of many of our sisters and brothers, and other effects of such adverse acts, we firmly believe that only through effort for peaceful resolution of hostilities while addressing the root causes of such violent acts comprehensively and not just militarily will genuinely answer the roots of violence that is rampaging across our land. In the midst of a pandemic, it seems government has been deaf to the cries for mass testing, relief for the most vulnerable and the poorest of the poor, protection of our health workers, and a comprehensive plan to address this public health issue without draconian measures to curtail fundamental rights and freedoms. Other religious congregations have issued statements include the Jesuits, La Salle Brothers, the Vincentian and Franciscan families, the Religious of the Good Shepherd, St. Scholastica's College, the Pontifical and Royal University of Santo Tomas, and the Sisters Association in Mindanao. The bill is currently pending with the Office of the President and will lapse into law if not acted upon by July 9. <laughs> Now for our weekly roundup of congregational news. New Bishop of Holo ordained. Bishop Charlie Inson of the Oblates of Mary Immaculate was ordained in a simple liturgical celebration last May 21. Ordaining him were his confers Orlando Cardinal Quevedo and Archbishop Angelito Lampon together with Kidapawan Bishop Colin Bigaforo. Bishop Inson was a provincial superior of the Oblates Fathers prior to his appointment as bishop. Sulu and Tawi-Tawi had been under the minister of the Oblates Father since the 1930s. Osamis Archbishop Emeritus Jesus Dasado CM passed away. Archbishop Jesus Dasado CM, Archbishop Emeritus of Osamis, died last June 23 in Misamis Occidental. Archbishop Lozada was ordained a priest of the Congregation of the Mission in 1966 and was ordained bishop in 1977. He served as a Zamis Archbishop from 1983 until 2017. He was the last Vincentian bishop serving the Philippines. He was buried in Osamis Cathedral last June 30. RGS Sister installed new provincial government. The Congregation of Our Lady of Charity of the Good Shepherd, or more popularly known as the Religious of the Good Shepherd, has installed its new provincial government. Father Edward Cometa of the Diocese of Cubao presided over the installation of the new provincial superior, Sister Susan Montano RGS and her government, in a liturgical celebration last June 29. The Dominican family holds its rosary rally against COVID-19. <clears throat> the Dominican family in the Philippines successfully mounted its rosary rally against COVID-19 last May 24, feast of the translation of the relics of St. Dominic. The celebration, which was broadcast online, was led by Father Napoleon Sipalay Jr., OP, prior provincial of the Order of Preachers, representatives from the Cooperator Brothers, Contemplative Nance, 
Active Sisters, Dominican Lady, the Dominican Network Group, and the Priestly Fraternities of St. Dominic led the prayer. The Rosary Rally comes a month after Father Jared Francisco Temenor OP, Master General of the Order of Preachers, also asked the entire Dominican family to participate in a worldwide Rosary Rally against COVID-19 last April 29. DepEd Region 11 ordered the closure of the biggest IT school in Mindanao. In a statement, the Department of Education Region 11 announced that they have sent a communication last May 21 to the Community Technical College of Southeastern Mindanao or CTCSM ordering its closure due to incomplete submission of documentary requirements and deficiencies in the implementation of the K-12 curriculum. The school administration has questioned the closure order, especially since they were given permits to operate in the past. In a statement, CTSCM Chairperson of the Board of Trustees, Sister Concepcion Basang of the Missionaries of the Assumption, lamented that we would have expected an attitude of collaboration and expanding partnerships with all agents of action, whether public or private, big or small. She also added that we look forward to a day when government, civil society, the private sector, and local communities are able to work openly and democratically towards the achievement of the rights of our disadvantaged and marginalized children and youth as an important foundation of the democratic society. With 353 students from indigenous cultural communities, CPCSM was the largest IP school in the country. With nearly four months on lockdown, the Philippines have implemented what has been recorded as the longest lockdown in force worldwide due to COVID-19. This means also that for more than four months, churches remain closed and priests and religious have been forced to find ways to reach their faithful through traditional and social media. And so online broadcasting of liturgies, or what one scholar dubbed as liturgical televisuality, has become popular in the Philippines, with many parishes and convents broadcasting not only the Eucharistic celebration, but also rosaries, processions, holy hours, and other paraliturgical celebration. Leading the pack is the Manila Cathedral, whose page has reached nearly 250,000 likes and whose daily masses reach as high as 60 to 70,000 views. We talked to Father Reggie Malikdem, rector of the Manila Cathedral, about their experience. Here's what he has to say. So, yun yung, ano na, wala talagang, wala talagang plano, wala talagang preparations, basta sige lang, uh, gawin natin, and then, kung ano man yung meron tayo dito, uh, ginamit lang namin, no. Nagulat kami, actually, after the first live stream, no, uh, kahit na na-delay, may mga, I think, we reached, ano rin naman, I think, a thousand or more, a little more than a thousand, no. Uh, and there were many positive comments. Even for from brother priests, mm -hmm. so dun kami medyo na ano na uh, parang parang uh, ano naman meron kung kung one thousand yah that is not the the, the normal uh, uh, mass goers ng daily mass natin so marami yah marami yah dun dun kami nagsimulang uh, uh, makita namin na this must be something serious <laughs> kung kailangan serious sa natin tong uh, uh, live streaming of masses na ito. Uh, yung una, kung ano nga lang yung meron. So, cell phones. Uh, and then, habang tumatagal, kasi uh, pag cell phone and wifi, ang daming interruptions. No? So, during the first month, talagang, sabi ko nga, nagkaroon ako ng devotion kay, Saint, uh, kay, 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 kay Venerable Carlo Acutis. No? Talagang, every day before the start of the of the live stream i would pray i would pray sana walang interruption sana okay yung internet uh, i think ano eh, two two things din sa challenges eh. first is technical talaga no technical and that that is the responsibility of our 
uh, social media people, yung mga nasa Catholic social media ministry. Uh, so, we, we need to be technically prepared. Uh, and we have to invest on this. No? Equipment and people. No? Sabi ko nga, yung, yung social media, social communications, Vatican to pa yan eh, 1960s pa yan eh. Pero we only discovered its importance because of this pandemic. No? Very essential yung clear audio at saka video. No? Kung hindi maganda yung audio mo, aalis yung mga tao, eh, aalis yung mga viewers. Eh. Kat hindi maganda yung video, uh, the interruptions, aalis talaga, aalis sila. So, but liturgically, no, liturgically, yung second aspect, I think, uh, yung proper way of celebrating the Mass. Uh, uh, pag nag-uusap kami mga pare, I would always tell them na, yung, yung, when we live stream our Masses, we have to be constantly aware that we are not just broadcasting a show. Kasi nakaharap, nakaharap kami sa TV, sa, sa camera, no, we might think that this is a show. But uh, but uh, we are celebrating. Ang 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 totoong nangyayari ay we are celebrating the liturgy that is broadcasted. Starting this weekend, AMRSP Media will also begin our liturgical broadcast, starting with the Holy Rosary tomorrow, Saturday at 8 p.m. from the Chapel of Saint Joseph's College in Quezon City. This will be followed by the Sunday Eucharist at 4 p.m live from the National Shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes, also in Quezon City. More religious reports to come. Here, on your new religious routine every Friday evening. This is The, the 8 p.m. Habits. picture of our four peaks, one word. Place your answers on our Facebook Live comment section using this format. Hashtag 8pm habits. Hashtag four peaks, one word. And your answer. Don't forget to share the segment. No share button is invalid. You're still with us here the 8 p.m. habits. In this segment entitled POB, Points, Opinions, and Views, we will discuss hot topics and key social issues that impact our society today as we all together try to understand them from the light of the gospel and our consecrated lives. And tonight, we will discuss about the controversial anti-terror bill passed by Congress last June and is currently pending for signature of President Duterte. Now, to give us background of, of what the bill is all about and why many human rights groups are protesting against it, we will be joining by Zoom by Attorney Gilbert Andres, the Deputy Executive Director of the Center for International Law Philippines, or Center Law, and the founder and chairperson of the Advocates for Freedom of Expression Coalition Southeast Asia or APICC, Attorney Gilbert, good evening and welcome to the APM Habits. So Attorney Gilbert, help us to understand what is new about this anti-terror bill and what should be watched out for.
Yes, this anti-terror bill, if we compare it with the current Human Security Act, there are actually many loopholes and there are many avenues for abuse. For example, in the Human Security Act, there are only about four crimes. In fact, there's just one. It's just terrorism. Then there's a, uh, there's a inciting, there's accessory. But here in this uh, new anti-terror bill, there are actually nine. There are nine new crimes. And if we look at the crimes, they are so overbroad to the point that it even penalizes just mere speech. For example, inciting to terrorism. So it can be by speech. Uh, so that's one thing that is very uh, worrying about the anti-terror bill. The second most worrying thing about the anti-terror bill is that uh, the definition of terrorism is uh, very vague. In fact, it it expands on the original definition of terrorism in the in the human security act to the point that they added some some intentions for committing terror for example if i may cite it it says here that there's a create an atmosphere or spread a message of fear in fact, in, in any sermon, in any homily, there's also a, you're spreading a message of fear, di ba? Kasi it's a, there's a warning. You continue in your sin, you go to hell. So it's so overbroad. And the third most worrying point of the anti-terror bill is that it actually gives our law enforcement personnel and military personnel 14 days it gives them the power to detain anyone who are mere suspects of violating the anti-terror bill for 14 days, extendable to 10 days. So that's 24 days. So it's almost one month on mere suspicion. There's no warrant of arrest that's issued by the court. There's no probable cause, mere suspicion. So these are the three worrying aspects of the new anti-terror bill. So Attorney could the human security law be retained and amended instead of passing a new bill? Yes, in fact, the human security law uh, has more safeguards. And this is coming from a, a lawyer of a petitioner against the Human Security Act. We actually challenged this before the Philippine Supreme Court on behalf of a member of the indigenous people's group, uh, an ETA. So, and yet this was dismissed by the Supreme Court. So coming from me, it's so ironic that I will have to say the Human Security Act has more safeguards than the anti-terror bill. Attorney Gilbert, um, the Senate President uh, Vicente Tito Soto III was recorded as saying that hindi na kailangan ng martial law kapag napasa namin itong anti-terror bill. Now in a few days, even without the President's signature, the bill will lapse into law. So recently, what does your organization intend to do if and when the bill finally becomes law? When it comes into law, we're seriously considering of filing a petition against it in the same way that we filed a petition against the Human Security Act. In fact, what Senate President Tito Soto said is very accurate because with this anti-terror bill, in fact, in the Constitution, in Article 7, if there's a suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus and there's an invasion and there's someone who's being accused of rebellion, they can only be detained without warrant for three days. So it seems to be that the Constitution itself sets a three-day maximum detention rule. And yet here in the anti-terrorism bill, any mere suspect, suspected any person merely suspected of violating the anti-terror bill can be detained for 14 days plus 10 days. So pang essentially, we have a suspension of the privilege of habeas corpus and a de facto martial law. Interesting. These were updated. And, yeah. uh, in fact, in some convents and churches, they're mm. talking about this. Yeah. And uh, even the amendments and the other uh, things regarding anti-terror bill. I think uh, 
attorney enlightened mm. at the the the, the gist mm. of this anti-terrorism bill. Actually, okay. it is frightening. So somehow, like for me, listening to attorney general, like, we have to do something also. Like mm. we cannot just sit and listen to the news. Like something has to be done. Actually. Thank you. So thank you very much, Attorney Gilbert of the Center Law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's my great privilege. So we will be taking a short break, and when we return, we will be joined by Ms. Rose Trahano, the Philippine Alliance of Human Rights Advocates, or PARA. Here on your new religious routine every Friday evening. This is the 8 8 p.m. Habits. of the four peaks, one word. Place your answers on our Facebook Live comment section using this format. Hashtag 8pm habits, hashtag four peaks, one word, and your answer. Please share the segment. No share icon is invalid. Here's the latest from the CBCP and from the diocese. New Archbishop for Cagayan de Oro appointed. Pope Francis is appointed Bishop Jose Cabantan, currently Bishop of Malaybalay Pukidnon, as Archbishop of Cagayan de Oro. Bishop Cabantan was originally a clergy of Cagayan de Oro before he was ordained Bishop in 2010. Bishop Cabantan replaces Archbishop Tony Ledesma S.J., who turned 77 last March. Archbishop Ledesma is also the current chair of the CBCP Episcopal Commission on Mutual Relations. Quiapo Church on Hard Lockdown The minor basilica of the Black Nazarene or Quiapo Church is currently on lockdown after one priest tested positive for COVID-19. According to Father Douglas Badong, parochial vicar of the church, this is the second announcement of the church lockdown of a minor basilica after the Basilica Minore del Santo Niño in Cebu also implemented a quarantine after one of their collaborators tested positive for the disease. Dumaguete Bishop deplores broken record. Dumaguete Bishop Julito Cortes has issued a statement last June 19 calling for the end to the culture of impunity after the spate of killings in his diocese. Bishop Cortes further said that words fail us whenever somebody takes another person's life for whatever reason and leaves the dead victim's family groping for answers. The recent statement comes after Harrison Gonzalez, a barangay captain in Dumaguete City, was shot and killed by four unidentified assailants, not a week after Feliciano Troza, another barangay official from Santa Catalina, Negros Oriental, was killed by a lone gunman. Pope's Day Celebration in the Nunchichu Manila Archdiocese Administrator Bishop Roderick Pavillo celebrated Pope's Day through a Eucharistic celebration in the Apostolic Nunchichu last June 29. With the current lockdown, the usual Pope's Day celebration were cancelled. But nevertheless, Bishop Pavilio continued with a simple celebration in the Nunchi Church Chapel together with Monsignor Julien Cavore, Charge the Affairs and Interim, and the Nunchi Church's other staff. In his homily, Bishop Pavilio emphasized the service element of the Petrine and Pauline ministry, noting how both of them placed themselves completely 
and the service of the Lord our Master. Meanwhile, here's the top story from the Vatican. Pope Francis adds three new Marian invocations in the litany. In a letter released by the Holy See Press Office last June 20, Cardinal Robert Sara, Prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship, announced that Pope Francis has approved the addition of three new invocations in the litany of Loreto. Mater Misericordiae, or Mother of Mercy, Mater Spe, or Mother of Hope, and Solatium Migrantium, or Solace of Migrants. The additions are currently the most extensive addition to the litany made by any one Pope since the litany was codified in the present form by Pope Sixtus V in 1587. The addition comes as the entire world celebrates the special jubilee year to celebrate Our Lady of Loreto, which began last November 1 on and will end on December 10 this year. Congregation for the Causes of Saints announces newly approved miracles and martyrdoms. The Congregation for the Causes of Saints announced in two separate decrees since May the impending canonization and beatification of sainthood candidates, many of whom come from religious families. Those to be canonized are Blessed Cesare de Bus, founder of the Doctrinarians, Blessed Charles de Foucault, spiritual founder of the Jesus Caritas family, and Blessed Maria Domenica Mantovani, co-founder of the Little Sisters of the Holy Family. Meanwhile, we can expect the beatification of the following. Venerable Mamerto Eskew of the Order of Friars Minor, Venerable Francis of the Cross, founder of the Salvatorian family, Venerable Jose Gregorio Hernandez, layperson from Venezuela, Servant of God, Sister Maria Laura Mainetti of the Daughters of the Cross, Sisters of St. Andre. Venerable Michael McGivney, founder of the Knights of Columbus. Venerable Pauline Marie Jarco, founder of Living Rosary Association. Servant of God, Father Simeon Cardon and Companion Martyrs, Sister Chan Monks. And Servant of God, Santes Pesotto, Franciscan <coughs> New Directory for Catechesis Issued The Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization released an update directory for catechesis in a press conference held in Vatican City last June 25. Archbishop Rino Fisicala, President of the Pontifical Council, hopes that the new directory will be of real assistance and support for the renewal of catechesis in the one process of evangelization that the Church has not. Tired to carrying out in the 2,000 years, in order that a new world come to meet Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God made one of us for our salvation. The directory is an updating of the General Directory for Catechesis issued in 1997 and aimed to bring the Catechism to the digital reality of today's world. That's it for this week's dose of stories from the Church and the Society. Join us next Friday for more of The, the Religious, Religious Reports! Reports. Welcome back to POB Points, Opinions, and Views. We have with us now our second guest, leading human rights activist and member of the Philippine Alliance of Human Rights Advocates, Ms. Rose Trajano. Good evening and welcome to the APM Habits, Ms. Trajano. Um, earlier we heard Attorney Gilbert Andres discuss his legal concerns on the view. Now on our part, as a human rights advocate, how do you intend to respond to the statements of the bill's proponents, particularly Senator Laxon, who said that if you are not a terrorist, you have nothing to fear on the anti-terrorism bill, and the Filipinos seem to believe the senator? Uh, sister, thank you for the question. Um, matagal na po, wala pang anti-terrorism uh, bill or law, no? Uh, our human rights defenders, our human rights community, even of course the church 
and whoever uh, is critical no, uh, to our government have been targeted, have been uh, intimidated and harassed. So, bakit kailangan pa nila ang, ang, ang anti-torture law and they, they are already doing it to us? No? But, uh, of course, this anti-terrorism uh, act will actually aggravate the human rights situation in the Philippines. Uh, sa totoo lang po, um, napakarami ng mga pangyayari sa atin. Napakarami ng mga batas. As mentioned earlier, diniscuss ni Attorney Gilbert yung anti-terrorism law. Uh, marami po ng mga batas, mga policies, and executive issuances uh, who are, which are really challenging no? para sa ating mga human rights defenders. Like the Executive Order Number no. 70, uh, yung pong uh, Securities and Exchange uh, Commission Memorandum Number no. 25, na kung saan all NGOs, all CSOs, are required no, to submit a comprehensive profile, including the names of our leaders, our beneficiaries, where we are um, operating, and even our uh, mga partner agencies. No? So, ibig sabihin po, they are already preparing all of these documents, all of this information, na pwede nang magamit para sa Anti-Terrorism Act. Uh, earlier, I was discussing with Father Ajay na uh, ang gagawin siguro sa atin ngayon pa lang ay nag, nagpe-prepare na sila ng dosyer natin. No? At once na ma-implement po agad itong uh, anti-torture, uh, anti, sorry, <laughs> anti-terrorism uh, act, no? once na-enacted ito, ay magpa-file na agad sila no? sa, sa korte. O oh, judge, ito yung aming gustong mga, ito ang pinagsususpechahan namin. So immediately, we can be under surveillance without us knowing it. Ang ating mga telephones ay delikado. Ang lahat ng ating social media accounts ay delikado. Kasi ito po yung magbibuild ng mga evidences, trumped up cases against us. No? And this, of course, will impinge doon sa ating right to expression, no? uh, yung ating pagsasalita. Hindi na nga nila kailangan yung anti-terrorism law. Nakakalungkot po sa panahon ng COVID, dalawang mga teachers na simply sumasamang-masama lang ang loob nila, nagsalita sa kanilang mga social media accounts. Nahuli, nakulong, nag-bail. No? Buti na lang si Teacher Mas ay na-dismiss yung kaso sa kanya ng uh, inciting to sedition. Look at that. So what more pagka meron ng Anti-Terrorism Act? They can do everything and they can really suppress and repress uh, our rights as human rights. Especially sa ating uh, pagsasalita sa mga kapatid natin, lalo na yung tinatawag natin prophetic witness natin. Mm -hmm. Eh baka target din tayo, kaya nga sigurado, Ms. Rose, ang tawag natin dyan ay terror bill, hindi anti-terrorism bill. <laughs> okay. Lalo na pag nag-copy kayo, di ba? Tama. So, Ms. Rose, why is vigilance against the bill necessary? What are Paras' plans in order to continue to promote and protect human rights in the face of the possible approval of the anti-terror bill? Sir, no, 1986 natin itinayo ang, ang para at kasama po ang AMRSP dyan. Uh, and ever since we were in the front line uh, in defending uh, human rights, in ensuring that our human rights are protected and promoting it. Dito po sa anti-terror law, buti na banggit nyo, ng tamang term sa kanya ay anti-terror bill or anti-terror law. Tuloy-tuloy uh, po yung ating kampanya no, to to really stop its uh, enactment sana. But uh, of course, even if the president does not sign it, no, it will lapse into law by July 9 po yata. No? So kunyari ay uh, hindi ko pinirmahan yan. Pero eventually mag uh, magiging batas din pala siya. So tuloy-tuloy po yung ating gagawin mga kampanya against the terror uh, act. 
gusto nating malaman lahat luna ng ating publiko, ano pa talaga yung mga provisions na ito at paano sila maapektuhan din. Hindi lamang po tayo alalahanin nila lahat ng ating mga kaibigan na magla-like sa ating mga Facebook, delikado sila. Lahat ng mag-a-agree doon sa ating mga pagtingin ay pwede rin silang mapagsuspechahan. So dapat tuloy-tuloy yung ating pag-i-increase ng kanilang kaalaman. Pangalawa po, sasama po kami o magko-competition kami doon sa mga initial na plano ng ating mga legal group na magpa-file sila at ko-questionin yung constitutionality ng Anti-Terror Act. No? And we will be also in the forefront as competitioner nito dahil kailangan ma-question talaga natin. No? Uh, pangatlo po, hindi lang din naman dito sa national level tayo nagkakampanya against the Terror Act. Pati po sa international. At siguro alam na naman ng natin, we are noting that the international community is already alarmed. No? Because for us, For me, yung pong report ng Office of High Commissioner on the War on Drugs in the Philippines is already an indictment of this administration. Pag nangyari ang Anti-Terror Act, it is already a conviction na ang trend, ang pattern, at ang record ng Duterte administration is actually against human rights. Talaga yung ipapasalamat po kami kasi ang IDF na Tampara kasama ang Task Force Detainees ay kailanman hindi tayo nag-iiwanan no, sa ganitong gawain, Ms. Rose. Eh, ngayon po, itong aming programa, eh, marami pong mga madre, pare, mga laiko na nanunod ngayong gabi. Meron po ba kayong mainumungkahi na habang may repaso ito at inaantay natin kung ano talaga ang gagawin ni Duterte? Ano ano ba, anong inyong inumungkahi na gawin ng madre, ng kaparean, ng, ng mga laiko. Opo. Alam nyo, uh, alam nyo, the church has always been our sanctuary. <laughs> Di ba? Ang nagbibigay ng lakas ng loob sa ating mga common aktivista at mga human rights defenders. Because we know, when we speak, when something happens to us, andyan ang simbahan para kukupin tayo. Uh, as how you did it, No, sa panahon ng martial law at hanggang sa tuloy-tuloy. So we are counting on our church, our religious community to continue to study yung mga batas, yung mga repressive laws uh, and policies. Um, buksan ang inyong mga simbahan, ang inyong mga sanctuary, tumulong magmulat sa ating mga kababayan at syempre tumulong na makibaka po para sa karapatang pantao. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Aklip, no, na meron pa rin tayo mga kasama. Meron mm. tayong katuwang. Sa loob ng simbahan, sa labas ng simbahan, o tayo mm. na simbahan na may katuwang mm. para dito sa pakikibahan natin, lalong-lalo na kung ang karapatang pantao ang uh, delikato. Mm. Okay. Yeah, the church has always been a sanctuary. Yeah. Mm. Yes, thank you, Ms. Rose. Thank you, Ms. Rose. So, so thank you very much, Ms. Rose, Kahano of the Philippine Alliance of Human Rights Advocates. Later on, we will hear the POB of the Church. And stay with us. After the break, we will be joined by priest and lawyer, Father I.J. Chan Gonzaga of the Society of Jesus. Back and more when we return here on your new religious routine every Friday evening. This is the 8 p.m. Habits. Us here on the APM Habits, 
Now on to our last guest of the POB segment joining us from Cagayan de Oro by a Zoom priest, lawyer, professor, and director superior of the Xavier University, Ateneo de Cagayan, Reverend Father Ismael Jose Chan Gonzaga III, or Father IJ of the Society of Jesus. Father IJ, good evening po, and welcome to the 8 p.m. Habits. Let's cut to the chase, shall we? <laughs> Many religious congregations, including the Jesuits, already issued statements against the anti-terror bill. From your point of view as a religious and as a lawyer, what bothers you about the bill? What should we, especially religious men and women, be concerned about? Good evening, sister and fathers, and to all who are watching the 8 p.m. habit. Um, thank you for that question, sister. And it's something really, that question is something we should be, not just for a few of us, but for all of us to really think and reflect on, especially as religious and as uh, men and women of the church. Uh, the terror bill in itself, you, we will always try to look at the positive side and see that it was passed, hopefully, for uh, for protection. But our, our question would be to protect whom and to protect what? Um, the question when you pass a law is that are there no laws that are already in place that can be used for the possible necessity of government in order to put in more security? The difficulty we have, and we've already spoken about this a number of times, the, the Jesuits, even the religious congregations, that the difficulty of the Anti-Terror Bill Act of 2020 are twofold. One, it is ill-timed. Okay. In a time of difficulty, when our country is facing a, a serious pandemic that, that we cannot even control as a, as a people, and we cannot even try to, to bring our acts together, you rush, an, you rush a law that is not just ill-timed, that's ill-thought of, ill-prepared. And you ask, for whose benefit is this? Why do we need such a law that has taken away so many safeguards, as Attorney Andres already pointed out earlier, and you put in something that actually, in a way, is, to put it bluntly, a gagging of a person's um, capacity to speak out or to, to actually issue an opposition. So when the question talks about when the question talks about um, when the question talks about <clears throat> sorry about that when the question talks about um, significance of the bit of the law, I I cannot seem to to even understand how we can be in a rush for that given what we are undergoing today. Um, maybe if you, you want, uh, we can clarify that later on, no? Kasi, um, maybe just, as, uh, just an ad addendum to that, to, to sister's question. I've been in Cagayan recently, but I was assigned in, in Bukidnon last year. And we see the difficulty of the uh, New People's Army recruiting uh, Lumad children as, er as young as 12 to become combatants. And the military is, are using that as an excuse to try to suppress um, certain communities. But we're saying um, that's not how you, you do things. We have actually laws already in place to protect that. Why do we need an, a, 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 a terror bill that Senator Luxon is trying to, to really insist on as something that can just curb communism and terrorism when you actually now have broadened the definition of who a terrorist is? So... It actually opens so much difficulties. In fact, in Mindanao, like remembering uh, Patricia Fox mm -hmm. and other religious men and women who are working in the Philippines, I think uh, before this anti terror bill you know, was introduced, there were some of the people who were in the So uh, I believe. We're fortunate that may mga congregations sa talagang merong ganitong uh, assistance like the Jesuits. I know Attorney Mary from 
Savior yung nakasama ko po siya sa Geneva last year. Mm-hmm. So sana yung ibang congregations nila no, ay talagang tumulong din tayo para ma-uplift yung mm-hmm. ating mga kasama. So, for the benefit of the religious men and women joining us tonight, maybe they're also wondering, how do you think that can this bring in danger our prophetic witnessing being lived out and concretized in the Philippines today? How do you think it will affect our ministries, especially to the poor and the marginalized? Father. Thank you, Father. Father. Um, if you won't mind, kasi nga, we're gonna be, if ako, I prepared this specially taking into consideration that I'm hoping many of our religious congregations, men and women, are going to be listening. No, let me answer that in two questions, as uh, in two levels, Father. First level is that <laughs> even without the anti-terror bill, I believe the church, especially in our country today, has to take a deep, long look at ourselves again. Um, nakakataba ang po ng puso ang sinabi ni, ni Miss Rose kanina that the church is sanctuary that the church has always been to whom they would run to for assistance. But we take a deeper look at ourselves the past few years. Have we really been sanctuary? Um, we have the moral obligation to effectively teach our faithful. Um, have we become really prophets? Or have, become, or have we become too comfortable in the silence of our own safeties? The difficulty of the church today is that we ourselves are divided. And, and, and even in social media, we see that. How can we actually, I think we need to prophesy first to ourselves. How can we even prophesy to talk about prophetic witnessing when we cannot even witness to our own lifestyles, to our own how we how we treat people we work for and work with. How can we actually prophesy, be good prophets and witnesses when we ourselves have become wolves in sheep's clothing? And, <clears throat> and the difficulties that we see that, we run a lot of our schools, we run a lot of schools and universities in the country. And yet, what kind of electorate do we actually produce? We keep... I, I really, ako saludo ako sa, sa prophetic witnessing nila uh, Bishop Ambo. But the difficulty is that what are we in our capacities as mentors, as formators, as, as teachers, as pastors? Why can't we seem to have that ascendancy that we used to have? Because we've lost it. Eh? And that's the difficulty. And... Um, we have, we have been comfortable just watching from the sidelines. So if we talk about prophetic witnessing and how it is interpreted in that anti-terror bill, para sa akin, maski walang anti-terror bill, are we actually prophetically witnessing? Our prophets are already marginalized even in the church itself. Basque, Sister Pat, what have we done for Sister Pat? Wala. How many few congregations tried their best? But what as a, as a bishop's conference, as, really, as AMRSP, what did we do? We need, to, we need to really bear witness to ourselves first and really ask those hard questions. Are we ready? Are, are we ready to, to go against a government who will actually be able to gag even the church? Oh, I remember Father Bernas teaching us during Constitutional Law 1, uh, Constitutional Law 2, and he says, um, in the Bill of Rights, when you talk about freedom of religion and uh, freedom of religion, it says um, there are two things. The freedom to believe is inviolable. Even the state can never question what I believe in. But how I practice that belief is not absolute. Okay? And he would always have that funny comment about, I can believe that my mother-in-law is evil. And that's all I can believe in, fine. But if, my, I, if I say that I believe my mother-in-law should be sacrificed in human sacrifice, then the, the state can, can set in to say, you cannot do that. You do, you do not burn your mother-in-law. And now you're, now you're saying you have an anti-terror bill that says, no, you can actually gag because this is inciting. And, um, but can we be strong enough to, to actually raise our voices? 
as as a as a as a church as an institution um i think that's the more the the deeper question we will have to understand and have to to answer and if we're afraid of this terror bill then I would really throw this challenge to the AMRSP and to all of us. How far are we willing to go? How far are we willing to also embrace people like Sila Ms. Rose who are looking to us for sanctuary? So um, that's my, you know, that's actually um, before talking about contradicting the church's response to our cry for the poor or social justice. Have we been actually witnesses to social justice? Um, I guess we will have to answer that point blank first before we can actually challenge this government. Of course, we have to challenge with that but yun. I mean, I'll be open to 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 your end for that, sister and others. That's really a, a, a big challenge for us, and I thank Father IJ for reminding mm. us of our responsibility yes, to respond, tama, especially for our prophetic witnessing, mm. you know. I is a confession of Kati while walking, you know. I heard some nuns, oh, there's a place for like this here. Uh -huh. So, sana tignan yung madre, madre ka ba talaga? Kasi <laughs> imagine reacting to that situation. Mm. And not even that, uh, yung yung mga kapatid nating mga consecrated person na parang wala silang pakialam sa mga issue mm. na nandun sila sa comfort zone ng kanilang mga kompento. Kaya mm. Father RJ, maraming maraming salamat po sa pagbabato ng hamon na yun. Mm. Actually, when Father, I, when Father RJ was talking, like, okay, we are, we are, like, we are telling or we are, how can I say, we are so noisy, noisy. <laughs> we are telling something against this anti-terror bill. But when he says, like, let us also look at ourselves, like, mm. what are we doing? How are we living our life? Like, I think the point there is, we become more effective in our witnessing when we, when people around us, we see also how we live our lives. So, like that, we continue with our witnessing as prophets, at the same time, we live also as mystics, as really as, as with the vocation that we have as religious consecrated men and women. Para doon sa mga terrorist ng madre. So, so again, thank you very much, Father, and good evening. That is Father I J Chan Gonzaga of the Society of Jesus. Rector of Xavier University, Ateneo de Cagayan. Father Angel and Sister Happy, any comments on the discussion that we had this evening? Since this is our pilot episode, yes. parang, <laughs> uh, parang we can talk about issues mm -hmm. openly and uh, we can also relate with our guests. And of course, the, the consecrated people are watching us yes, tonight yeah. ay participate So if you have comments, uh, if you have suggestions or if you have any topic that you want us to discuss to this POV portion, just uh, put your messages on the comment section. section below. Yeah. Sister Happy. Yes, I already said that really uh, it's important for us to live our lives really as, as mystics, like really to, with that kind of witnessing, to make our, our, our words more effective and more powerful and more credible when we live our lives also credibly. So we will not finish this uh, this uh, segment without asking any parting words for our guests. I guess, yes. Tonight. Simulan natin kay... Uh, Attorney Gilbert. Attorney Gilbert. Or maybe may mga programs kayo gustong i-plug. Hmm. Or, uh, yes, go ahead, Attorney. It's really important that we respect human rights because we know that in our Christian doctrine, man is create man and woman is they are created after the image of God. Tayo lang po yung merong imago day, wala po sa hariyop, wala po sa tanim. Kaya mahalaga po ng respetuhin ang human rights. It's not just because we respect the person, but we respect the God who created that person. And that's why we have to question seriously the anti-terror bill 
because if we look at the mere provisions, it actually violates the Constitution, which provides that we have the right to life, liberty, and due process of law. Maraming salamat po. Now, Ms. Rose. Uh, salamat po uli and I and pasensya na po I completely agree with Father IJ na hiya lang akong banggitin kanina but we really need you to speak out more uh, we really need again to hear your voices and to guide us no? dito sa madilim na na panibagong period no ng ating bansa uh, with regards to anti-terror law as I mentioned earlier po uh, it will not only be the human rights defenders, the activists, the vocal critics, no, who will be uh, affected or impacted by this law. Lahat po tayo ay pwedeng mapagsuspechahan. Lahat po tayo ay pwedeng mapahamak. Kaya dapat po uh, tuloy-tuloy ang ating pag-aaral, ang ating pag-aanalisa, uh, at ito ang kailangan na paggabay ng simbahan sa mga tao. Maraming salamat po at magandang gabi po. Father Ijing? Finally, yes. So, good evening again. And, um, Attorney Gilbert put it so perfectly you now when you talk about we have been always made in the image and likeness of God. And my good day has always been the root of our respect for human dignity and human life. But also, the, therefore, as church, we have to be strong in that and that we will have to be strong together in our witnessing. And um, we, are, we are not saints. We, we are sinners. Yet we know that we have been immensely loved by a God who is unconditional. And therefore, we're also asked that can we actually, we cannot just simply stay quiet as people fall along the road. On this. We, we have to speak up. And we have to speak up together. There's strength that the opposition are being able to do because as a church, we have been divided these past few years. And we have to really put our acts together. So I'm really hoping that we can be the prophets we were once. Thank you. Thank you. Maraming salamat po. Sana po sa inyong tatlo, hindi po ito ang huli. At makasama namin kayo sa mga susunod pa pong segment ng VOB. Actually, with this explanation, with, the, with their points, also mm -hmm. Father IJ, Miss Rose, and Attorney Gilbert, like it gives us as religious like more reason or, parang why do we have to speak out? Like why do we have to stand mm -hmm. for this matter? So it has been clarified and strength. We are also strengthened with this um, with this stand. So really, we have to speak out. Mm -hmm. Again, maraming maraming. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much. Is our final picture of the four peaks one word place your answers on our facebook live comment section using this format hashtag 8 p.m habits hashtag four peak one word and your answer please do not forget to share the segment no share icon on your answer is invalid Thank you very much for joining us in our premiere episode. It has been and will always be a pleasure to be with you as we end the week. We also thank our guest co-host who has been with us for our premiere episode, Brother Darren Husay of the Order of Hospitaller Brothers. Thank you, sister and father. May we welcome the weekends with hearts full of gratitude and faith for our Creator who has been with us and never abandoned us during a long week of hard work and toil. I am Brother Daryl Husay of the Order of Hospitaller Brothers of St. John of God. Join us again next week for more stories from the consecrated life, the church, and from our society. I am Sister Happy Montesilio of the Daughters of St. Anne. And I am Father Angel Cortez from the Order of Friars Minor. We have been your companions in your new religious routine every Friday evening. We are the 8 p.m. Habits.